nanohub.org. Online simulation and more for nanotechnology. So today's session, it, as I mentioned earlier, is Introduction to Microfluidics. Uh, Professor Terence uh, Kuzma, uh, we, finally, we, we finally call him Tur, and I think that's what he likes to be called, Tur. So now, now fasten your seatbelts, because now, now we get, we get Terence Kuzma, or Tur, uh, we'll, we'll talk to you a little bit uh, about my, uh, the introduction to microfluidics, okay? Thank you. Well, today what I wanted to cover is microfluidics. And, and microfluidics is an odd growth of like the semiconductor market. And it's kind of, in some senses, a lot of it is where it meets biology. So often you'd like to look at biological entities or examine them or like culture cells or see how drugs react with cells. So this is a good way of doing that. And this evolution has came about because there's like an assembly line and tools that are common for the semiconductor market. And the things that we had in the semiconductor market, we can now apply to like the bio nano market. And that's very, very common. And I guess the big reason is why did semiconductors, you know, make the pathway for us? And it's because of all the money. So there's a lot of money in iPhones, et cetera, and so that kind of technology can now be transferred to biology. So, I mean, I'm, I'm just one person and I'm not, you know, have a big opinion about it, but I've always thought about biology in some senses is there's a lot more in my personal opinion. There's a lot more to know in biology than there is in semiconductors or physics or whatever. Biology is just insane. And but the, the people that work in biology, they have so many variables and they're still like in the mortar and pedestal days. So I, I, I don't know that that's just how I envision it. So this actually brings the technology of the modern semiconductors to the world of biology. And it's interesting that I've taught at Penn State for 20 years or over 20 years. And I first started teaching and everybody was semiconductors and electronics. Then it started to grow and evolve, and I went to classes, et cetera, for biology and whatnot and, and, and got schooled on those kind of things. And Penn State has a medical school, so it was easy for me to do those types of uh, that type of research and attend those types of classes. So I grew within that area, and it was impressive that I did it at the right time. Then all of a sudden, I start getting biology students like crazy. So it, it turned out to be that I think the breakdown of students has really steered itself to a lot of students that are interested in biology. And at Penn State, besides the undergraduate courses that I teach, I also teach uh, a couple graduate courses. And one of those is in nanobiology applications. And this is like from that course. And this is also from a mathematically based and the graduate course that I teach, this presentation would be on the three hours long. So I had to cut it down to an hour and a half for this time slot. But a lot of the really good information is here naturally. That's how I selected it. And then the information that's here and how this is structured is it's a discovery, right? This is a discovery introduction to microfluidics. So what are we trying to discover? And one of the things that we're trying to discover here, what are the typical problems in microfluidics? So it's not like the same world that we're in, like we go to the grocery store, we go to get some gas or whatever. It's not like that. In that world of physics, in the micro world, things look a little bit different in materials. So it's actually very suited for the technologies and techniques that we have from the semiconductor market. And then there's a layer of, Boy, microfluidics is different than, you know, filling up your, uh, you know, sink to wash the dishes kind of stuff. That fluidic flow there is a lot different. So I'm going to present kind of like the quintessential problems, challenges of microfluidics and the quintessential resolutions to this technology. And along the way, I want to establish some vocabulary that, that would be foundational across the microfluidic re uh, realm. So that's my... That's my objective, how about it? So what I wanna do is define what is microfluidics. Then I'm gonna look at the physics of microfluidics, like I just mentioned, is different 
than normal day fluidics, you know? Well, maybe not. We look at things like my tractor sitting outside here. Well, I can see it through the window because I got to go finish the grass cutting for the season here. The, when you compress that hydraulic fluid into a cylinder, you can get like a multiplication of movement, right? And when we look at things like hydraulics on a tractor, they're really high pressure. So you could take that, that we're looking at, you know, lines on my tractor, like they're probably quarter inch, half inch lines on the bucket of my tractor out there. I got a big Kubota diesel. Th that compression into that small thing, the, the, the physics and the heat and the load, it's different, you know, it's some because my tractor can pick up a ton. So that's really impressive, you know, and we're getting that by that compression of that fluid. But when we're looking at uh, fluids in microfluidics, we're usually looking at something like a couple hairs. So it's really, really small and the fluids get in there like really thick for that dimension and things are really, really difficult to pump. So that's a big, big issue. So those are some of the fit. And the other thing, like I showed in the videos, I have some video links from YouTubes and I think they're only like five minutes long or seven minutes long or something. They're really good for that amount of time. They point out the atypical problems like fluids don't mix. Like you put two fluids in a channel, one stays on the left and one stays on the right for the most part. That's the rule of thumb in microfluidics. And I have that here kind of, but not in the microfluidics. Behind my house is two really brilliant, nice, some of the best trot fishing in Pennsylvania. And the one creek is really cold and the other one's warmer. But you can go a half mile down the creek and stand in the warmer section or the colder section that that water doesn't meet. And I'm sure you've all seen pictures of the ocean, like fresh water and salt water, different color waters and how they don't mix. So actually the natural regime in microfluidics, the default physics is not mixing. And let's make an assumption. We got this microfluidic chip to do something or else we'd set our two beakers of like cells and drugs on a shelf. We have to get them together intimately. So actually the natural regime of microfluidics is non-mixing. That's a big issue. So we have to take care of that and take care of it eloquently, not in an area that's scientifically really crazy and cool, but it, a way that's like scientific and easy to do. And that's what we're trying to do here. And then we'll look at some operational components, like what's a mixer, et cetera. And that might surprise you compared to like, mixing up some cheese and vanilla and sugar to make a cheese and some eggs to make a cheesecake, you know, we're going to look, mix them a little bit differently here. And then we'll look at some applications. So that's what I'm going to do. So what is microfluidics? The big question here is what is it? And it's really the science of designing and looking at materials on the order of nano or pico liters. So this, what we're looking at here, and this is amazing and things that we have to like picture in our mind, a, a 30 nanoliters is a thousandth of a droplet, one one thousandth of a droplet. So we don't need that much stuff. So if we were looking at DNA or the COVID virus or a crime scene or some of these other kind of things, we don't need that much of a sample. Does everybody see that? So we might be able to take in a small sample of a DNA fragment, you know, a bone fragment or something, and then be able to, to, to clone the DNA like a PCR reaction, and then be able to identify in some senses maybe a victim or something like that in a, a burnt building or 9-11 or something like that. So this, this is like a really neat thing. And that small amount of material is, is, is very telling about the power of this, what we can do. And if we were trying to look at like drug discovery or something, we don't have a lot of like dangerous drugs. Does everybody see that? Or if we're analyzing something, we don't need a lot of it to analyze. So this is really good. And this picture here tells a lot. So this drawing right here is pretty cool. And what we see is that's my chip and it has reservoirs on it and all that. And that's where I'm gonna interrogate my cells or grow cells or look at a, a, some type of chemical reaction on a nanoscale or sort cells, look for a cancer cell in a, in a healthy bloodstream, et cetera, like circulating tumor cells. We can use that to identify that. And what you see is there's like a laser or light that comes in to help us do the work, right? And 
this represents, at least to me, that's a chip that's in like another component, like a lab. So interestingly, what we would like to do is a main goal in microfluidics. We don't want to make the microfluidic device very complicated because it's disposable. So we would like to have lasers and all that other stuff outside of it, like in a laptop computer, and then we just plug it in like it's a CD or something. And these chips, I have one in the presentation, a chip is typically like this big, like a little cassette. And we would put that in with the material that's, and then the videos show that too, that I have in the links. We would put that little cassette in there and then the machine would do stuff like have sensors to look at it, have power supplies and all those other kind of things. And they could remain as a fixed cost and we don't have to replace them all the time. So the lab on a chip is a small disposable thing but that's really good because it costs a heck of a lot of money to dispose of like bioreactants. So small, the efficient use, not that much of material like anthrax or something. That's a really good idea. Does everybody see that? So this is a lot of times they call it lab on a chip, but I like changes on words. It's actually a chip in a lab, like an interrogation kind of stuff. So I like that flip of the words and it explains a lot. So that, you know, this simple drawing here elicits me to tell you that story, that it looks like that that is floating in some kind of smart other device. And that's true. And that's what we want. Does everybody see that? So this is certainly describing what a microfluidic chip is. It's very simple and does real small stuff and it's really efficient and fast. So we really like this stuff. It's, it's cool. So microfluidics handle small amounts of fluid. This is really good when we only have small things to examine. Like I said, it, some like DNA at a crime scene or one of those other kind of things. And I rarely watch TV, but they have like that. When I go on vacation, I watch, they always have like NCIS marathon on or something. So me and my wife watch that in the Food Channel. When we go, go to the hotel and after we're out, we, we come back and we watch those kind of things. And the girl's always plugging her thing in and the computer does magical things. And that's what we would do here, same kind of thing. And we would solve some crime like Scooby and those meddling kids, you know. So generally, these, these chips use a small amount of energy. And the system is very contained. So there's lack, there's reduction in contamination, right? And this small size leads to mobility. So we really don't need a big lab, you know, a building. We might run these things, and certainly a driving force is, we would plug these into often like an iPhone. So you can get like an adapter, and you might be able to plug that in, and, and the power from the, the battery in the iPhone might be able to do it. Or we could use the camera on the iPhone to do some examination and stuff like that. So smaller and portability is really good. And this would be great if we were testing for pollution in some stream. So we don't have to take it back to the lab. We can test it right there. And I know a friend of mine, what he does, he runs a sewage plant in a little town down the road here that dumps into one of the best, you know, down stream from me, but it dumps into one of the premier trot fishing rivers or streams in Pennsylvania. So he has from his small town, he has to make sure that that stuff's not gonna kill the fish. And they're always measuring those kind of things. So this would be very applicable for that. Or constantly measuring maybe the uh, waste material coming out of a plant so that it's not polluting the water table either. So these things are really good. And because they're on a small scale, these chips tend to be fast and you do them right there in real time. So I could somewhat picture, I'm gonna go out to take a sample of a river and I can have my microfluidic chip and I would get a response back of whatever I'm looking for before it would take me time to drive back to mail it to a lab. And that lab stuff usually is an overnight or two night affair, right? So this stuff is really immediate, you know? So somebody asked me in general, and you know this, I can't really say, but I'll take a guess. How, how quick would a microfluidic chip work? Well, it depends on the chip, but I'd say something like a half hour or, hour or something. It's not gonna be days and weeks. 
it, it's going to be pretty quick. It's going to be pretty quick. Like the time it takes you to make dinner. There's, there's a number on that too. Who knows what that number is, right? But it, it, it's relatively fast, right? So this is what a gene chip looks like. And it's a nice picture because the hand gives you a size for the scale. So this could analyze genes and gene expression in things like the COVID virus or in corn or in ticks or in anything else like that, right? So this would give you a, a, a readout of mRNA or DNA kind of thing. And it's a very valuable thing. And this is made uh, by Affymetrix company. And they're one of the leaders in the world in this type of technology. So these microarrays, what they will do is on the array itself, there's thousands of little dots on there inside that purplish part. And on what, each one of those dots, we write a specific code that's known for this DNA, cancer, mRNA, protein, whatever we happen to be examining. And then we, we take the unknown quantity and we flow it across there. And if they're the same, they'll match. And when they match, a little light bulb comes on. And there's 10,000 light bulbs on there. So they can really, this, what's nice about this chip is, if you can envision this story, that chip, I could write on that chip, I could write all the coding for prostate cancer, like for men. And then I could write on there ovary cancer, like for women. And then I could write on there some kind of cancer disease, like for parakeets. And I could write some kind of disease for dogs. And that could all be on the same chip. And then I take somebody's sample like a man and I'm looking for prostate cancer and I'm paying attention to the prostate section because that that's meaningful. But what the other sections would do, if they light up, that would say that the chip is bad and a false reading. A lot of times in a sensor, this is classic sensor. You have the sensor measure things, but you have it also say it's not giving you a bad measurement. Does that make sense? So you're doing all that. And then what does that mean? A manufacturer can make one chip and it can measure four different things. So like in a doctor's office, maybe this can be used for different cancers. It can be used for stroke victims. It can be used for COVID patients. So this one chip could do multiple medical things. Maybe I'm just saying maybe, and you would want that because again, that's giving you a positive reading and then false readings. And then you're like, Hey, something's wrong here because we know that a woman's not going to have prostate cancer. Right? So that's what we're looking at here. So that's really cool. So this lab in a chip, it could offer utilities that it's like a, a real lab and it does more than one test. And that would be really, really good. And it can analyze genes for, agriculture, for veterinary, for people, for pollution, uh, not pollution, but maybe mutated things in nature that saw pollutants. So those things are like really cool, you know? So that's a microarray. So why they're important? Because they can do all kinds of stuff. And this is what they do. So we, we would like prepare these microarrays. We have like the normal tissue and the abnormal tissue. And then we write on our chip, the like matching Velcro to that. And if it actually comes on that we have like the abnormal gene that represents ca cancer, we have the right stick to it. And what we would do on the patient's cancer or the patient's mRNA or DNA, we would attach another nanoparticle like a plasmon when you hit that with light, a real small piece of metal, it'll put out a lot of light. It reflects light back. It captures light, integrates light, and then it will output light. So then when those lights on those little dots come on, you're like, oh, you're positive for, you know, prostate cancer or whatever it happens to be. And again, we could have prostate cancer written online, number one and two, six and eight, you know, 12 and, and 13 or whatever, we can write them on different lines across the chip. And then not only we test you once for prostate cancer, we can test a, a patient's thing like 10 times for that particular disease, redundancy. So these chips are really good because you can have a lot of faith in them. They're not contaminated, they can be redundant and they can show you false signals. So, you know, looking at this, 
from not a material engineer perspective, but from maybe like a, a medical doctor, which I'm not, you're like, well, how do I have faith in this? And how am I representing a patient well? This, this chip has a lot of built-in integrity into it and really gives confidence in the next step is we got to take you to chemotherapy or something. So that's really kind of cool. So these things are neat. So I usually always run this as a project in my classes at Penn State. And the courses that I teach, we, we learn how to do like the material processing things like etching and deposition and functionalization of these different dots and how to make nanoparticles that glow and how to make PDMS that's the top part of this, the transparent, how to make the bottom part on silicon. So we learn throughout the semester how to make one of these and a bunch of other things because they're like puzzle pieces. You can do these different skills and you could use them to make, I don't know, an artificial tooth or you can make an artificial knee or you can make lab on a chip or you can make a, you know, a, a smoke detector. They're really all the same thing because it's a machine shop. And what can you make in the machine shop? Just about anything. And what can you make in the nano machine shop? Certainly things like smoke detectors and certainly things like DNA lab on a chip. So when you learn these foundational things, these skills, these material skills, you can build all kinds of crazy things. And this is one of the crazy things that you can build. And like I said, we always do this. I do this in the undergrad class and the grad class. Yeah, good stuff. So is this really important or not? It is. Look at the growth of this stuff. So the money's there because now people are saying this is a better application. So this is a really, really good field. And now these things like lab on a chip, you know, whatever, 20 years ago, not so much. Now, much. Does everybody see that? So these things make a lot of sense financially. This is like looking at things historically, maybe for your interest, how things were done. So we first had like micro machine kind of things like ink generator kind of stuff back in the 1960s, right? And then we did like our first labs on a chip, like in and about the beginning of the 1980s, like at MTV time, like when they had MTV on it for the first time kind of stuff. So we had it from like the Beatles into the MTV thing. And then it really got modernized around the year 2000, these things got to be, I don't know what to call it, more mature technology. And then people were really insightful that they had, in some senses, a basic architecture for microfluidics. And then they're like, oh my, I can test this. And oh my, look, I can test this too. And oh my, I could use that same chip and test other things. So there could be certain standard designs, like we looked at those microarrays, and we could use that for proteins, we could use that for DNA, we could use that for all kinds of different things. And then the, the amounts of DNA proteins or, you know, like for, you know, plants or animals or whatever. So these things have like wide, when people started exploring this, they're like, man, the, the applications are almost unlimited. So that's where we're at today. So we're really looking at uh, this as a, a very mature technology now and a very useful technology. And then one of the things that we're looking at, and I don't have too much time today to talk about it, is maybe like, I think microfluidics started out somewhat like paper, like litmus paper, test for something, see if it's acid or base kind of thing. And then it moved into maybe put nanoparticles on it and do like an early pregnancy test. And how that works is you have two particles and they're a certain color when you look at them and they're coated with like a hormone kind of thing or enzyme. And then when the hormones come in, they'll change states, the chemical state, and those particles will go together and they change color. So if you're not pregnant, it's blue. And if you're pregnant, it's pink kind of thing. So those things were like, and somewhat like paper-based kinda. But then things evolved to, they were on a silicon chip with a, maybe a PDMS, which is the stuff they make contact lenses out of, that they would sandwich on the top and then make a three-dimensional construct. That would be like the next generation. And then in retro, it went back to paper again. They discovered how to do paper was even cheaper 
and more like paper tricks, like embedding them between like plastic layers, like you would laminate, you know, no trespassing sign made out of paper and put some plastic on it. They do that kind of thing now. And it's interesting that they use like a real laminator and they adjust the temperature and the pressure and, and the, the type of paper. And you can get all kinds of different microfluidics physics out of that. And it's real simple and it costs less than a cup of coffee. That's what's cool. That's what's cool. So here's, uh, we're in the outline here. There's some microfluidic devices there. So the small scale microfluidics leads to unique con conditions and unique considerations. So in a real world, we don't really worry about all this hydrostatic pressure from the fluids because we're drinking things out of like big bottles like this. But you know, if I was trying to suck this out of something big as a hair, I'd have a hard time and my ears would hurt and stuff like that, you know. I say my example is when you go to Wendy's, you know, the fast food place, milkshake, but they're not. They're ice cream. And then they give you this straw that's like this, and it's made out of like quarter, and then you're like, Rah, and you usually put it on your dashboard and let it melt a while before you can suck it out, or else you'll go death. Your eardrums will pop trying to trying to get that into you because it's so so you know stiff so that's that's so when we get so then imagine you got a wendy's milkshake thing or whatever they call it a frosty and they give you a coffee stir instead of the big heavy duty straw and you're trying to get that ice cream in you like with the so things get out of control and we're looking at things as big as a hair so nature does this by like capillary action. We do it a lot by electrical bias because physically forcing things, really hard to do because the pressures go through the roof. So as the resistance goes up to flow, the energy necessary to overcome that resistance is tremendous. So a lot of times better than pushing it, we pull it with electrical energy. Like we would pull on ions that are inside there or we elicit a charge on the sidewalls, like a Dubai layer, and then the sidewalls can be charged and the fluid rides on that charge just like an electric train. So that's some cool ideas there. So that's what we're looking at here. So factors like surface tension, laminar flow. Laminar flow is when two liquids are next to each other, but they don't want to mix. That is the natural and it's in those videos that I recommended for you guys. In there, if you get an air bubble, then fluids can't, the air will compress, but fluids don't. And an air bubble is like the death of microfluidics. So we get rid of air bubbles. Usually we put them under liquid in a vacuum and it'll suck all the air bubbles out. That's a common theme in engineering to do. Use vacuum to get rid of air bubbles. Even when you cure things like epoxy or polymers, you do stuff like that. So those are good tricks that are used in technology across the board. So this is electroosmosis. And really, this is, there's two forms of this, electrophoresis, which is particle flow, and electroosmosis, which is flow from the sidewalls. So what we do is we bias the sidewalls here. The fluid gets a bias, and it becomes like a train on tracks, like the maglev trains that they have like in Japan kind of stuff. So they ride along that bias and then the fluid can go through there. So I always picture this as like a snake swallowing a moss. So you can see them, you know, when they swallow a moss, they go down the, 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 the snake. So anyhow, this is electroosmotic flow. We use electrical bias on the fluid itself to draw the fluid instead of pushing it. So this is a case of push or pull. So we're gonna to try to pull on it with this electrical bias. And so one of the things that we're looking at here is, but these are the problems. So they don't mix, they don't wanna mix, do not mix, so we have to overcome that. And then pressure waves in the fluid, when we push on the fluid, like in this direction, I push on the middle fluid and the edges on the sidewalls like this, the sidewalls elicit a resistance. So the wave looks like that. Does that make sense? If I had another wave like this, 
and I pulled on it to some like bias over here, then what would happen is the stuff like the sidewalls, if I did that by bias, the sidewalls would do the opposite thing. And I, my wave front would look like this. So when it goes into a, a wall or goes into a bend, it has a different shape. So the bend is going to be different. The shape is going to be different and the mixing is going to be different. So depending on how you push or pull the flow and the geometry of the microfluidic device makes it mix. And this stuff is like watching a hurricane develop on, you know, the, the, the weather channel. This stuff is all crazy mixed together kind of stuff like that, like a vortices kind of thing. It's really hard to picture it at the level that's necessary. We would usually use high-end computers to plug in the data. And then the interaction between all these issues is so complex, the computer would have to generate an answer. So we generally use maybe another take home. We generally, because this is so complicated, my presentation is simple, but the act of microfluidics, the physics of it is very complicated. We usually need really powerful computers and powerful software to envision what the flow actually does. Luckily, there's some back of the envelope algebra, which is good, that'll give us a, like a 90% good accurate reading. And then beyond that, we would have to tune in the ideas with a computer, but at least we're like operating in a, we can guess a familiar zone or manufacturing window to be in. So you can set dimensions and after you set the dimensions, you can see what really happens and then tweak your dimensions. And you could even do that with a computer. But I don't know, I think you could probably get by without a computer if you did enough iterations and you had some good algebra guessing. So that's really, really good. So curves cause mixing. So you might think you need a mixer like a bread mixer, like a dough mixer kind of thing or a mixer you'd use to make like cheesecake. I got a handheld one to make cheesecake. You know, I put my cheesecake in there. It has an impeller on it, just like the back end of a, a boat, right? But we wouldn't want to do that because it's too complicated. So a mixer, just jagged lines in our design, just bends is a mixer because the things hit the bends at different speeds and they get twisted around. And that's what we want to examine. And there's all kinds of mathematics for that. So when I teach this in a graduate class, we do all kinds of like real cool mathematics kind of stuff which is neat because I paid for so many credits in mathematics. I got to use it sometime or I feel like I shouldn't have paid them student loans off. So, cause there's all these variables. Sometimes we use a computer. So there's no like rule, but we can get things out of algebra, but this is how things mix. And when we look at down the bottom here, we put in something that looks like a rainbow. So that's our different chemistry. And then we look at it in them stages as it goes through them zigzags and we can see that it's turbulent and the turbulence causes the, the chaotic mixing in there. So you really don't want a mixer that's actually turning like on a rotor. That's too hard to do. A good thing is just in your design, jagged lines like that. And these lines, what they'll do is, when you look at and study microfluidics, which is really neat, there's all kind of little different geometric designs like this. And I don't know that much about art, but these things look like really symmetric and neat and cool. So there's all kinds of things that like how nature forms like seashells and stuff. They, people see that and they're like, Oh, that's efficient because nature does it. And then they'll copy those kind of things. So it's really neat. Like they would use like, I don't know how horns grow on sheep or something those that that kind of mathematics to be able to do mixing because they look at these things are like capillaries in your system to produce blood blood for your body right so there those are interesting things too like the capillaries in your body they have capillary kind of things in microfluidics and that's a, certainly a, a dimension to microfluid or an area of study so that stuff's pretty neat so this is how fluids normally flow we put the fluids together and mechanically, 
They don't like the mix. So they'll stay as separate streams. Now, chemically, they'll like to diffuse with like Fick's law. And there's equations for that, simple equations like the Pecklet equation. That'll tell you how there's chemical diffusion that follows like Fick's first law, right? So those kind of things can happen. But if your chemistry isn't very different, then you're really not going to see that much mixing. You need to have that gradient, right? That would be part of it. So we need to find out a way of not relying on uh, chemical affinity and gradients to do the work, although that happens too. Mechanically, we would like to mix it chaotically, physically. And that answer would be those jagged lines. So we can estimate whether things mix or not in like a straight line or in a geometry by this thing called the Reynolds number. So this guy is from 1824. So that's cool to 1912 he was around. So I guess he was there at the Civil War time kind of because that was the 1860s. So he was in there around that kind of stuff when people – still had swords and shot with smoothbore muskets in a big line. This dude was figuring out microfluidics. Other people were shooting Napoleon cannons at each other and riding on horses and didn't have indoor plumbing. And this dude is figuring out microfluidics. So hats off to you, Mr. Reynolds, because you must have had a Reynolds. You must have had a hell of a good breakfast to be figuring this stuff out when other people were charging each other on horses. How about it? So that's cool. But this dude figured this stuff out and he made this simple equation by looking at nature and it has the diameter of our enclosure. It has our fluid velocity, the fluid density and the fluid viscosity. So this really is very descriptive of the main players when you look at a liquid. And when you plug in this equation, you get this number. And we call it the Reynolds number out of respect from guys that were doing mathematics when there wasn't indoor plumbing and refrigeration for your beer. He was doing all this work. So you get this Reynolds number. And the number compared to a chart, let's take a look at that. So when fluids flow smoothly, when they have a low Reynolds number, Reynolds number. When the number is higher, then it's gonna mix. If it's a low number, they don't wanna mix. So what we could do as engineers, maybe to improve mixing, we would take our fluid and add some other fluid with a different viscosity. That could be part of our game plan. Beside our design, we can modify the fluid too. Does everybody see that? So anyhow, when we look at this, this is the Reynolds number. For really low numbers, it doesn't mix. For bigger numbers, it is going to mix. Does everybody see that? And when we look at this chamber down below in the drawings, we can see things that have a low Reynolds number on the left. And if the Reynolds number is higher in the same device, it will mix better on the right. So we can change the device or we can change the, the, the fluid somehow, like by cutting it. Does everybody see in that? If, if it was possible, maybe we could add water and it wouldn't upset the experiment that much or something. So maybe we could do something like that. You know, it depends. Depends on the experiment. So in different geometries, beyond even just that low Reynolds number, high Reynolds number between the two, there's another aspect that we can map on top of that without a supercomputer. We can say, what does the geometry look like? Is it a cylindrical pipe? Is it parallel like square walls? Is it a wide open channel? Or is it around like a sphere? And those different geometries elicit turbulence. So based on that geometry and then map to the Reynolds number, we can have a boundary to where we're gonna say that we're having mixing or not. So another layer, you know, the first layer is the Reynolds number. But then we could get even a little bit more precise because we can say we can change the shape of the geometry of the chamber that the fluid's in. So this is another layer 
of complexity. And it's pretty cool because, hey, we're, we're digging on some algebra right here. And then we're digging on identifying shapes. So this stuff ain't that hard. And it takes you a long distance to, to like predict whether you could see mixing or not. And then you could do stuff like this, grab you some colored fluids in a microscope and see if it works, how you checked it out anyhow, right? So it's pretty cool. So this is an example of water. So just to say, does water mix or not? And the number we come out with is 0.056. Well, that's a pretty small number. So we're expecting it not to mix. And in, in a channel, in a 50 micron channel, we're gonna say a cylindrical pipe here, a number less than 2100, no mixing. So we compare a number like 0.056 to 2100 and it's way smaller. So we're gonna say with a lot of integrity that this stuff ain't mixing, how about it? So this is a really good thing. So what could we do to get this to mix? Well, we wanna have that number be like 3000 or something. So we gotta start doing stuff like changing the dimension right up here, D of 50 microns. Well, maybe we want to make that a hell of a lot higher because it's going to make my Reynolds number a heck of a lot bigger. So this is the, the pecklet number. And the pecklet number, as I said before, because I like to say things two or three times, the pecklet number is a number that's driven on diffusion. So this is like a fixed law kind of number. So what are we talking about so far? We're talking about like the Reynolds number, the Reynolds number mapped on top of geometry. Then that number is wrapped on top of chemical affinity with diffusion. And then that number is wrapped on the flow regime, whether the, the wave fronts to the front or the wave fronts to the back. And then things can mix around bends. Does everybody see why you need a computer? Because these are like differential equations on top of differential equations on top of differential equations. There's multiple variables here. So things get a little squirrely, at least paper and pen, pretty quick. So these were really good for computers. And th this microfluidics isn't just for inside a chip. Fluidic flow is, you know, they put smoke in front of an airplane wing with a fan going so that they can see the aerodynamics. This fluid dynamics or aerodynamics is how they design, you know, rockets or, you know, jets or jet wings or rudders on jets, you know, struts on jets those kind of things. So here's your pecklet number, and this is how things diffuse. So look at this, the Reynolds number is really cool. The one on the left has a Reynolds number 12. So look at it, in the same geometry is that Reynolds number and make Reynolds number, I keep on saying Reynolds, Reynolds number to a higher one like 70 compared to 12. In that same zigzag, it mixes a lot better. So what am I trying to present today? Well, one of the things is, is unexpected things don't mix in microfluidics. And unexpected, how would you mix it? Unexpected, it's zigzag lines. Isn't that something? And there's all kinds of different lines and shapes. And they're really like pleasing aesthetically and mathematically. You know, the, the mathematics of those are brilliant and how they form. And again, a lot of these things are seen in nature. So that, that design in microfluidics is very, very interesting. Very, very interesting. So this is mixers. So when we go from a small nozzle to a bigger one, the stuff comes out and blooms like this. And so then we can get mixing like that. And this shows us that mixing and what it looks like in this drawing down below here. But a simple mixer is going from a small dude to a bigger dude. So that's cool. That's easy. Cause you just do that in your CAD design when you lay out your chip and the, you know, the etch tool and the lithography tool, you just put that in as a picture and it gets replicated. So you do that design in like CAD and then you load this up and then you can just, in some senses, print these out. So that's really neat. So this is what a mixer would look like. And then there's common materials that we would like to use. And like I said before, earliest microfluidics, I would say 
and this is, you know, people say this documented, this is a common theme. It's not like my opinion. I'm just, I'm, I'm mimicking the opinion of many in my own that the first microfluid devices were kind of like lab on paper kind of stuff. And then people are like, hey, this silicon thing is hitting and I have a thermal evaporator and I have lithography and I have silicon and I have materials like PDMS, which is the contact lens material, silicone. And I can make these things and cast them. And they have to, they're relatively big, like hundreds of microns instead of submicron, like microelectronics. So they, they seem to be easy to do. And so now they borrowed, you know, the first generation were kind of like paper. And then they went to more semiconductors, which was kind of hard because you need capital investment to process those materials. You know, traits are moderately expensive, like silicon and whatnot. Paper just was looking cheaper. You know, paper was looking cheaper. So I thought it was very interesting. We borrowed a lot of this stuff from the semiconductor market, and it wasn't necessarily too expensive. But if there's a cheaper solution, that drives sales, right? So now people are going back more to kind of like paper technology. And in the other courses, I teach both, you know. And there, there's strong points and weak points to both of them. But the, the, the strongest point is probably in whatever, what your boss cares about and what the consumer cares about is money. You know, what would be the best bang for the buck? And, and that's relative because paper tends to be slower than the semiconductor driven ones. So maybe that's a, an issue and really an issue that might be non-negotiable for you. Paper would tend to be hours, maybe. I'm just taking a maybe here. This isn't like in stone, but you need to do capillary action with paper and it tends to be like slow. And then with real fluid, like juice running through a chamber, that seemed, that's a lot faster. So it might be a half hour compared to three hours or something. Maybe that's not a big deal, but maybe for you and your application, it's a big deal, you know? So we use a lot of times like stuff barred from the semiconductor market, like silicon and silicon dioxide. And everybody knows how to etch and perform and manipulate these materials well, because there's billions and billions of dollars spent on it every year. So that stuff is like pretty easy to do. Does everybody see that? And then there's metals that we use and there's a big selection of metals on the periodic table and alloys, et cetera, that we can use and borrow from the semiconductor market. And we can also use polymers because naturally polymers have all kinds of different advantages, like they're inexpensive, uh, lightweight, et cetera. And a lot of times transparent. So materials like that PDMS, which is the stuff they make, uh, uh, contact lenses out of that's a big time material in microfluidics. I'd say that's, yeah, one of the top things that people use and they use it because it's rather inexpensive. Maybe a quart of PDMS costs 40 bucks or something. So how many drops, a drop makes a chip, right? How many drops are in a quart? There's a lot of drops in a quart. So you get a lot out of $40 and that's half of your microfluidic chip. So that's a good, good thing to do. And here's some pictures of different microfluidic devices, you know, that people have on their web page, like Sandia or something like that. That one in the middle is like a ratchet gear system. That's really complex and hard to do. I was like, whoa, I like to try to make things simpler because then there's no failure, but that's more like a proof of concept. But you have a lot of these components like this in your cell phone, like accelerometers, barometers, and all that other kind of stuff. There's a lot of this stuff is incorporated in, you know, iPhones and stuff like that. Let me show you my iPhone. Now I can deduct that on my taxes as a teaching aid. So there you go, needed to have that. So here's some polymers. And then PMMA is another common material and they use it to bind together wood, like plywood. So it's like an epoxy. So PDMS, PMMA, they're really like in the uh, assembly line 
four law devices and they're borrowed from other industries because PDMS is silicone, right? Bathtub caulking, window caulking, contact lens stuff, right? And then PMMA is how you bind together wood and plywood kind of stuff. So those materials, they have properties that are actually controllable on a micro scale. So that's really kind of cool. So we borrow from them industries and integrate it into this world of microfluidics. So here's like sandwiches of, you know, PMMA, PDMS, polyamides. SU8 is a photoresist. And you usually can have it to have a high aspect ratio that it's really thick and can make really deep channels, et cetera. And you can do it optically, like process it optically, like make an image of it, cure it with that PSU8 polymer, rinse it away, and then it's rigid. And you could use that as a mold and then pour this liquid silicone over top, let it dry and then peel it off like a posted stamp. And now that's half of your chip. So how easy is that? And what did it cost you? A nickel? a dime, that stuff is really, really effective money-wise. So like this picture up here, these, that transparent chip in the upper right-hand side, that's probably made out of PDMS and the thing costs less than my thing of Lipton iced tea, right? So that's really cool. So technology is good, but cheap technology is even better. So that's really neat. So common materials are PMMA, that's the thermoplastic, and it's usually not transparent to light. PDMS is transparent to light. It's non-toxic. It can be cured. It doesn't have bubbles in it, cured under vacuum. You can cure it like in an hour at 100 degrees C. The stuff is really good. Like PDMS is like pretty good machine, material for microfluidics. And I have like sections in my notes and videos on just PDMS because it's such a like go-to material. It's like drywall when you build a house or something. It's like a thing, you know, it's cool. And then there's polyamides, you know, for strength and SU8 as like a, an optical, photo optical processed material that can make complex uh, devices and molds for us. So we make molds out of that. And it's real cheap because you don't need to like etch it and process it and all that other stuff. It's, it's really like a shortcut, really good stuff. So these are the common materials and where you can buy them at, name brands, about what they cost. So it's kind of cool. And if I'm looking at making stuff, should I use polyamides for like two grand for a kilogram? Or should I use PDMS for like 16 bucks a kilogram? I'm going to go to a meeting and raise my hand and say, I think we should use the stuff that's 16 bucks instead of the stuff that's 2000 bucks. How about it? So of all things in engineering, money drives stuff, but that's how it should be, right? Because when it's cheaper, it's more accessible and that's good. And then you can make more of them, refine them. To me, that looks like growth and maturity in a pathway. When things are expensive, they're prohibitive and they generally don't grow well because they're, they're constrained by the cost. So being cheap is cool. So common materials like PDMS, we can do a lot of different things to it and we can change the bioreactivity of it because one of the like go-to shortcut laws in biomaterials is the wettability of a surface, the bonds that are on the surface, the free bonds, that predicts the bioreactivity of a device. So a lot of times we want to have very little wetting and a lot of times we want to have a lot of wetting. And what that would do is maybe in some examples, like a quick example is to have cellular growth, we want to have wetting so we can have protein adhesion. And once we have protein adhesion, we have like signals to say, yeah, cells can grow here. And then you would have like a rigid platform to maybe start scaffolding to grow like skin cells. But if you had some other thing like non-wetting, no water, no cell sticking, maybe that would be something to have in your bloodstream so that you don't develop a clot. Maybe that would be really good for a heart stent. So depending on what kind of like catheter or you wanted to have a screw put in your arm 
to heal together a bone. A big concept would be the wettability of that material. And really eloquently, PDMS has at demand whether it wets or not wets. And the control factor then is we would apply like high energy oxygen plasma for a short duration and we can change that number. So it comes as we don't have many bonds, so it's inert. And then we put it in an oxygen plasma for 15 seconds and then it's like super duper active. Really that's what you wanna have in biology and somewhat in your portfolio is active or inactive bonds on a surface. So you can do anything with it. It's, so here's some common materials and we like that they're cheap stuff. And this is basically how we would make a microfluidic chip. We would get a master mold, maybe it made out of that SU-8 resist. And once you make it, you might do something like coat it with nickel or chrome or something. And then it's really rigid and it's gonna last a long time. And that'll be your mold, like your stamp. So then you can put that in a little dish and pour this PDMS over top, which costs 16 bucks a kilogram, put a couple of drops in, let it dry, usually in a vacuum oven under temperature and get rid of the bubbles. And then the PDMS is actually inert and doesn't have many bonds. So it peels off real easy and it shrinks a little bit. So it really peels off handy. And now we can like drill holes in it or something. And then we put a plasma treatment on it that makes bonds. So it has like a magic glue. And now we can stick it to a two dimensional thing that had my probes on it, like my metal and then my mRNA or whatever. And then I got me a lab on a chip. This is not that much different than making a grilled cheese sandwich. This stuff is not too complex. This stuff is about a zillion times easier than making a microprocessor. So if you wanted to do, somebody asked me, you wanna make microfluidics lab on a chip or do you wanna make microprocessors? I'm figuring I don't have to work 70 hour weeks if I'm making lab on a chip. And if I'm doing microprocessors, they're like, you're not leaving the fab. Our production is done. We're trying to do the impossible. So this would probably be an easier gig does everybody see that? Even an easier gig is just talking about it like me. I don't even have to do it. And it's Friday. I know I'm going out tonight. How about it? You know, so that, that's good. So this is the gene on a chip. So we have all these dots on here, like a zillion in this grid. And like I said in the introduction, we could draw all kinds of different things on this chip and have multiple tests, which gives us the redundancy of the test we want and also like a comparison for false data. So this is like classic sensor design, right? So that's really, really cool. And it gives us expandability because we can make this for both like males and females, for humans and for pets and things like that. So that could all be done at once. So it makes manufacturing a lot cheaper and stocking the chip a lot cheaper, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And then you could do things like this, like somebody has a stroke and an ambulance pulls up to the, get the patient. They can take some blood and put it in lab on a chip and they can have that data by the time they drive back to the, to the hospital. So they can do stuff like apply some anticoagulants for the stroke or whatever, right? So those things are really, really cool. And you can have that readout all done portable, not in a lab, in the back end of an ambulance. So this is really, really cool stuff. So here's some kind of conclusion. So microfluidics is a, an important growing technology that uses tools that exist in other markets such as semiconductors. So you don't have to reinvent the wheel. And, and, the, and the, the techniques that you need, for the most part, are super duper refined for semiconductors. And you probably don't even need that amount of refinement for lab on a chip. It's so much easier. And then key points that we looked at in here is the fluid regime, the fluid flows, the complexity of those vortices and things. They're really different than you might envision if you didn't attend this presentation. But those are all problems. But once we can establish problems as engineers, we can work on resolutions. So we can see those things and certainly see those things with 
aids of computers, which are jobs. There's a lot of people that like to sit down and write computer code. I actually don't mind doing stuff like that, but I never tell anybody because then I'll have to do it. But those things are pretty neat to do. So you can be like a mathematical modeler or sell that software or do analysis like that. So a lot of this stuff could be done in some senses virtually. And then I don't know how many applications there are. We've seen those graphs and I have even more because I wanted to keep the presentation shorter. But like the amount of publications and the amount of research and the amount of things that are done with microfluidics is just like incredible now. So these things are growing in my opinion, and this is just a personal opinion without data, right? But they're growing like cell phones, like the technology or like computers. They're really on the back end of that wave, but you know, they're, they're riding on the coattails of these other technologies. And as people advance things, it leads to other advancements. So these solutions become keys to other applications. So the microfluidic thing is like, it's a really neat area. And I think that it's really where a lot of engineering should be and is. We look at like the world of biology. We look at the world of mechanics. We look at the world of material science. We look at the world of modeling. It's an intersection of different classic genres in engineering. And that's where things happen. You know, when you have different fields that come together, that's really good. So I really like the word bio nanotechnology. To me, that just that spells modern science. And that's cool because it really helps people. Helps, you know, look at cancer or any things like that. It helps crops do better. You know, it helps, you know, veterinarian services you know, helps people that had a stroke. These things are like really neat, helps with pollution, detection. And you could have things like this all, all, all around. You know, you could test oil. You know, is the oil need changed in your car? You know, those kind of things. Does everybody see that? So this, this stuff is, uh, I'm happy to present microfluidics, you know. Any questions, guys? I'll look at my chat if you wanted to chat or anything. So my, my question was, I don't remember which slide it was on, but you had various um, designs for the, I'll call it the piping of your micro, microfluidic devices. And I'm wondering, you know, being a kind of a simple gas phase guy, um, do, you, do you run into problems with when you have angular structures um, with, uh, with either a mechanical water hammer type of problem or even a thermal problem? In other words, do they degrade at those points faster than they would at other points? Yeah, they would, but these uh, units, the units like this, they're really like one flow through area and then they're done. Okay. So these are all, for the most part, the, for the most part, microfluidic devices for like this testing for the biomedical market, we use them like in one singular thing and then we're, we're done. Okay. So we get some kind of results like a test, like mixing and a reaction, and then we analyze that reaction. So we're not using them for like a refinery where we're going to, you know, use them 24 seven and wear them out. Got it. But yeah, that's a good point. Thanks. And, you know, talking about those angles and I didn't have time, I have notes in like videos. You can put in like a rainbow so you can see the color and it goes through like a, a 90 degree bend. And when it comes out, it's all mixed together like the same color. But you can put it through a bend, and the bend is not like it's the 90 degree. It looks like a loopity loop little, let me draw it. You can draw something that goes through a, an angle like this or curved, and it really mixes. But you can go like this and make like a round thing on it that it looks like this. And when that rainbow goes in, it messes up the rainbow. When it comes out, it reconstructs the rainbow. It like mixes it and then unmixes it. These things were actually classic engineering from other, you know, like medieval kind of thing, days kind of stuff. And people had this stuff that they did in like the 1920s 
with mixing and unmixings to, to, to look to describe like chaotic mathematics. And it's really interesting. So if you want to go around a bend and not have erosion, you can actually con can control the spatially that it would buffer that impact. And then it doesn't even mix. That stuff's crazy. So there's so much to know. So I think this is exciting for mechanical engineers and fluid dy dynamic people. See, I'm a plasma physicist. So field was like plasma, plasma damage, and semiconductor physics. But then I did biomaterials at Penn State because I seen the future, right? And so then I went back to school and stuff for that kind of thing. And luckily, you know, I'm in a big university, so it's easy to access that. So that, that to me is from, I think it's exciting from the material processing. But then I also think it's exciting from the bio aspect. And then from the mechanical aspect, I think it's exciting. And that's where things really happen is in the intersection of these classic engineering disciplines. Because systems aren't like electrical engineering homework and systems aren't bio homework. They're a system, you know, and you have to use all of these things to solve them. And so then what you generally need in industry, this is for my students, you would have like the ninja expert in electrical engineering. Then you would have the guy that just talks about biology all the time. And we don't talk too much about him. And then there's all kinds of other guys that are on your team. And then you get together and then you solve these problems because everybody's like, I can do that part and I can do that part. So no I and team kind of thing. So that's really kind of neat. So you can have your expertise, but then you're always learning these other things and it's real interesting. So it's interesting and exciting. You know, so these things are really cool. Really, really cool. Yeah, for like big production stuff, the volumes here aren't good. You'd want to have bigger tubes and stuff, yeah. 